Welcome to Dare to Dream. This is Debbie Dashinger, and I'm thrilled as always to have you here with us today. A little bit later, I'm going to be bringing on the American actor and TV host, Sean Stone, to hopefully have some really out of the box conversation, especially about what's going on right now and some of the perceptions and information he may have that is not common knowledge right now. This show has been nominated for two People's Choice Podcast Awards as well as for some Webby Awards. You can subscribe to Dear to Dream. It's available on over 40 syndicated outlets. And subscribe on Apple and Google Podcasts as well as Spreaker, YouTube, BBS Radio, Pandora, iHeartRadio, etc. Please leave a review. It matters because people who love this conversation can more easily find it. We are ranked 200 in self-improvement on Apple Podcasts in the USA. And we're also ranked under 100 in the entire global reach under Apple Podcasts. And I think that's due to you. So thank you for listening and for helping our numbers get out there and helping our message get out there. This show is sponsored by Dr. Dane here and Access Consciousness. And if you are interested in energy shifting, quick results, go to Dr. Dane here, H-E-E-R.com, as well as accessconsciousness.com. So today we are asking the question, in your lifetime, what cosmic desire are you playing out? My guest today is Sean Christopher Ali Stone, who has been a spiritual seeker all his life, studying meditation and global religious traditions since his father took him to India, Nepal, and Tibet at 10 years of age. A student of history at Princeton University in Oxford, he's a published poet and has previously written the nonfiction history book called New World Order. As a media personality, he has hosted the interview program Buzzsaw on Gaia, as well as the news show Watching the Hawks for RT. He has acted in films such as JFK, The Doors, Savages, and Fury of the Fist and The Golden Fleece. Sean is the director of films such as Greystone Park and the documentaries Fight Against Time, Oliver Stone's Alexander, A Century of War, Hollywood DC, and Metahuman. Sean is accessible on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Sean, welcome back to Dare to Dream. It's great to have you. Thank you, Debbie. It's a pleasure to be back and to, uh, as you say, to be here to put some ideas outside the box and push the envelope. Yeah, the first thing that's notable to me in your, your amazing bio, it's always weird hearing your own bio, isn't it? Uh, you know, it makes me feel like I've done a lot in my life, and I feel like I've done... Uh, you know, just very minimal. So it's, it's, it's always a nice, I think it's a nice reminder that, um, we've, you know, I, I think each of us has accomplished a lot more than we realize. Mm, nice. Yeah, there is already a legacy being born there. So your father took you to India, Nepal, and Tibet at 10 years of age. Talk to me about that. What did that open up for you? What kind of illumination was created there? <laughs> it's a great, it's a great story because you know, I came uh, as, a, as a kid at that time, 10 years old. I think I was a uh, spoiled uh, American, you know, from a good background. Uh, you know, I had a lot of willpower. A lot of children have, have that, but I especially was a very uh, stubborn, willful child. And so uh, having grown up really with that ability to, you know, I just command, okay, I want a toy. I'm going to get that toy. I want, you know, whatever it is. It's like the sweets, the toys, the, the sort of the... The, the ideal, uh, you know, middle class, upper, upper, upper middle class dream. It was like, you know, whatever I wanted, it was at my fingertips. And all of a sudden you go from that, you know, privilege that we have in America, we enjoy in America. And, you know, in America, they hide poverty. There's definitely poverty here, but it's much more hidden. It's much more, um, not so much about the idea of, uh, how do you say, the extremes are actually more hidden in a sense here, where it's like, you know, people, are poor, but like they might still have a television, right? They might still have, um, you know, some of the basic amenities like air conditioning and things like that. Whereas when you're poor in a place like India, that's a poverty of a complete nature, different nature where I literally saw a, a mother with her infant child dying in the streets, right? As a, you know, as a 10 year old kid seeing this experience and recognizing the, the nature of poverty that was so different. It was, it was so beyond anything that you could experience 
yeah, probably in parts of America, I'm sure, in parts of Mississippi and places like that that are almost third world, yeah, that exists. But the actual direct experience of seeing death right in front of your eyes, disease, um, really just nothing, people with nothing, living in squalor, right, living in little, you know, complete homelessness, destitution outside of sky rises. We're seeing that a little bit more now in America, obviously, the growth of homelessness, but this was a different extreme. And so I think it was for me a wake-up call to say, wow, I've been so materialistic. I've been so attached to things that, you know, obviously, like I was talking to at that time, I remember I was 10 years old, there was a, a Dalai Lama, not the Dalai Lama, sorry, it was a young Lama, uh, uh, Panchen Lama or something that I was talking with and this Panchen Lama was my age and he was sitting there meditating and he had like you know just nothing he just was in his in his uh, being as as a student of Buddhism he was in meditation he was calm and here I was and I'm like where are your toys you know like where you know what do you do for fun right like my I need stimulation right we have so much to stimulate us here in the western material world and uh, there you know people just the, the way of being is it's a little bit different you're more maybe in tune with uh, the moment and the experience of just you know finding joy in the small things so it shifted my entire worldview from that point forward I was very stricken at heart mm -hmm. torn in my heart between wow like this materialism of the West and like all these things that we want the American dream and everything you dream you can get and I'm like but is that really what makes us happy and I'm like looking at the squalor this institution and so I really that was the beginning of my trajectory as a student of history of, of social of, of society of sociology of, of human nature trying to understand like what is it that we're really doing on this earth because if it's just to uh, aspire to have more goods and things i don't see us any happier as a result of it and i see you know plenty of americans suffering and and still like in that rat race and and yet I could say that there's more joy in sometimes in seeing the, the people that are living in squalor, but they're just happy to be alive and grateful for the little things they do have. And they're more human and engaged as human beings. So that's the spiritual path. And that's really what opened my, my vision to the idea of, okay, what is the spirit that really unites us as humans and guides us and that we are on, we have to awaken the metaphysical awakening journey that I realized we were on and I knew it was coming to America and it really came post 9-11 for me because I started to look deeper. I'm like, great, this is a wake up call. Death exists. We're, you know, we live with death every day, but we ignore it. And the rest of the world, they don't ignore it. They look at death every day and they live with it. So how can we start to confront death so that we can become more spiritual, more connected, more here, more present? You were inspired recently to take this philosophical collection of poems written in 1927 by Max Ehrman called Desiderata. And you wrote this really lovely illustrated audible book called Desiderata, a cosmic fairy tale by Ali, your chosen Islamic name. Mm -hmm. How did the idea of Desiderata compel you to dive into poetry and put this out at this time? Yeah. Um... So you mentioned the, the Max Ehrman poem, Desiderata. I think a lot of people have heard it. It's like, uh, go quietly amidst the noise and haste. Remember what peace there might be in solitude. And you are a child of the stars. Right? And you're, you're a child of the star. I mean, there's th that kind of language in it. You are a child of the stars. You know, you have a right to be here. I mean, these are the notions in that great epic. And it's a very small poem. I have it hanging in my, uh, my desk. My mother, I think, gave, me, gave it to me when I was a kid. And so I always loved the, the uh, sentiment behind it and then when I started writing what became the Ziderata the cosmic fairy tale by Ali as you say it's, it's on audible um, that story was to me it came like a download it was almost transmitted to me I just wrote it out over the course of a few weeks but it's essentially the poem of a, of a fall of two lovers who are in their paradise it's like you know the Adam and Eve story right and they're 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 finding each other and all of a sudden they're cast out of their love affair, their ideal world by the sorcerer. And the sorcerer is jealous. He wants that love for himself. And so through the incarnations on earth, it's a timeless journey of, a, of the man's character questing to find this woman, this love. And it's like he finds her in the form of the mother, in the form of the, um, the, the, the crush, in the form of the seductress, in the form of uh, a companion, in the form of you know, in the form of his jealousy for a woman. And so it's like all these different forms that he finds her in, but it's his journey 
to essentially realize that there's a transcendent nature to this reality. There are things that transcend this world. And so it's a very philosophical, lyrical journey, as you know, through the emanations of what it is to be human with this feeling like we're not really from this world. We're not really, you know, we're not ending here. We're not from here, but we're journeying for the purpose of learning and expanding in this poetic dance that is life. But ultimately, this is not the end. This is not the end of the game. It's just, you know, this is just one iteration of exploration for us to know what separation is, what, how we are separated from our source, from the essence of love that creates us, that we call God, we call, you know, the creation creator, and how we've been separated from that. But ultimately, we are journeying back to it as we dive into this journey and trust the journey of, of, of you know, what it is to be a human and to feel it and to not evade it and run from it and say, I don't want the dark. I don't, I only want the light. It's like, no, both have to go together so that we can remember what it is that is oneness. Yeah. There's an excerpt from the audible book, Desiderata, that you wrote, which is in the flowing tides of galloping quest, we have set eyes on each other, then lost our sight over and over until we learned to forget the chase. So here we have this epic poem, as you said, of two lovers is there something personal for you in the download and what you put out? Because I know you're actually in a relationship with your beloved, Kaya. So how, how does that manifest, that whole inner search uh, that you put out in your poem? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a very personal story. I mean, to me, that's my soul's story. I, I wrote it before I even uh, really met Kaya in this lifetime but I had known as a, a soul what it is to go through loss. And I, you know, I really feel, I'm not to say like I've suffered more in this lifetime or that lifetime, but I just, I feel the suffering of loss very deeply. And I think it has to do with many lifetimes of having known uh, loves and sort of, you know, expressions of our, you want to say, of my, you know, of kingship, of success, of at the same time hubris of pride and how we, you know the pride brings the fall I and mean, I feel like I've I feel like I've been through the, lo the loss of Atlantis for example I know what it is to see civilizations wiped out I know what it is to see like the greatest dreams of of different be of different life forms perish and wiped away and so as a soul I feel very I I feel very much in pain by seeing the world as it is now because I can, I see so much of what we could be if we really trusted what we are. If we trusted that, which is the, like the essence of what it is to be. When you're a child and you come into this world and people look and they're like, oh, what's the child? What have you drawn today? Wow, that's so powerful. It's so beautiful. They look, they listen to you when you're a child. They're so interested when you're a child. And then as life goes on, we lose the child and we become the adult and we become rigid. And it becomes, oh, that's an ideal. I can, that can never happen. And, we, and we, all of a sudden we shut out all the dreams that we come into this world with, all the energy, all that pure energy to say, wait a minute, why are we behaving backwards? Why are we treating each other like enemies? Why are we uh, putting each other into slavery, putting ourselves into slavery and sub subjecting ourselves to servitude and to the feeling of, of squashing our own dreams? Why are we doing that to ourselves? Why are we killing the child inside of us? Because the child in us is the, what has the memory of what our soul has been through. We've seen it. I think Part of it is there's a trauma that we carry, which is, wow, we've seen, we've seen worlds get destroyed. We've seen so much life die. We've seen the greatest love affairs. You know, you can read about in the histories, it's, you know, Antony and Cleopatra, what happens? Well, they kill, you know, he dies, she kills herself. I mean, that's kind of, you know, Romeo and Juliet. It's like, that's kind of how there's a certain bitterness that comes with being human. Mm -hmm. And you have to, in a sense, go through that bitterness, through the pain to then refine, reconnect to that inner joy that really is what brought you here, what seated you here, what brought you into existence. So it's like, that's what we have to get back in touch with is yes, we have done a lot of things through many lifetimes. We've hurt, we've, you know, we've tortured, we've conquered, we've committed atrocities, genocides, wars, but there's still life. And if we can just get back in touch with it at any moment, it's right there. It's waiting for us. It's in the eyes of the child and it's in your heart right now. And if I, that's what this poem really is about. It's like connecting back to your heart and saying, wait a minute, there is a love that brings everything in this world into existence and into this universe into existence. And if we can just connect to it and it's not just in your partnership, it's like, yes, you can bring it into your partnership, but you can do it on your own too. 
and just reconnect to it because we have that opportunity every moment to recreate this world. I gotta ask you as a man in a successful relationship, what is it that you do, especially as a man, what do you do in order to show up? Because as far as I'm concerned, at least my experience thus far, inherent in relationships, there's all the amazing good stuff, but then there's the, you know, the category that's more difficult. A lot of people say, oh, that's, you know, your core trigger wounds that you come up against. And in every relationship, you're going to bring that up in each other. And it's, of course, what you do with it. You can walk away and do that over and over again and never maybe really find real love. Or you can say, I'm sticking with this. There's so much good here. But how can we work through this? What kind of tools do you utilize, Sean, that help you transcend those things, that help you take a deep look, be responsible, whatever it is you do? It's work. I mean, I'm not going to lie and say that like a conscious communication is, is, is pristine, right? Because, you know, she, uh, she brings her wounds and, we, you know, I think she talks about this in uh, some of her work and the nature of, you know, the wounds of the feminine, right? The, the wounds that women carry in their, uh, in their DNA, in their soul memory, even in their own lifetime of what they've seen, right? And we've, you know, you can speak of it where, you know, there's different wounds that even different ethnic groups bring. But the female wound has been what? It's been basically living in what people call patriarchy. I think it's, it's actually more rightly defined as a boy's rule. It's like the people that are not, that are ruling have never been, are not men. These are not kings with, you know, with, 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 like Solomon, you know, with, with wisdom and, and, the, and the ability to um, really hold a space for justice and, and, for, uh, and for the female energy. It's like, these are not kings. These are boys that have been ruling our civilizations for, you know, at least thousands of years now. Boys who pretend to be men, you know, basically are playing out their little, you know, their cracked egos that are broken and, and splintered off and they have so much shadow that they haven't worked through. They want to pretend that they're something that they're not. And so I think the overall nature of our society is very much parasitic and it's been called patriarchy, but let's just call it what it is. It's a parasitic society. And so either way, it's fed upon female energy. It's, it's debased women. It's turned women to objects. And women also play into that problem just as much, as much as, you know, it's easy to say the men have done it. Women also treat each other in that way of jealousy of not holding uh, space and love for each other of not um, being able to honor and, 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 even themselves, right? Because there's a wound, a feminine wound about how do I love myself? How do I, you know, treat myself um, in a way that's, that is respectful of my boundaries, but also exploratory and, and, and open, right? There's this fear. There's always this, this battle between, we're going through it right now, between security and liberty, right? And we're sitting in our society, okay, I want to be secure. I want to put my mask on, I have gloves on. I'm going to stay six feet away, now 12 feet away, now 20 feet away. And it's like, there's that issue within all beings, which is more security. And then there is, you know, the desire for freedom and to, to have that freedom. So that's the balance. And men also have, are working through the same thing, obviously, as far as, you know, where is our, our natural impulse to, be free and to, you know, be the man. And we, you know, we, by nature have been explorers, conquerors, <laughs> you know, we've set, you know, we're the ones that set sail and disappear for months. And it's like, that's also in our DNA. So there's a reason women have a certain fear, right? And at the same time, there's, you know, fear for men of saying, well, how do we stay in a, in a relationship that feels safe and contained, but at the same time has a fluidity and an openness to receive other people and to receive energy from others. So I think it's an, it's an, it's an ongoing, um, it's an ongoing dance, right? There's not to say like a one way alone of, of, of answering how to hold space or to show up. I think that in my case, I consider myself a very open person. You know, for me, it's like, I, I believe in holding space and not judging as much as possible. Really like no matter what someone has done, if you can listen and hear it and understand it, then you are doing the greatest service towards their evolution and towards their ultimate healing. If we can't understand each other, if we can't understand where we're coming from, you see, then we go into ignorance and blindness, which is simply to react and to reject or to judge or criticize, right? And so for me, I think for my showing up, it's one of my strengths. And to separate, I have to say, if you're gonna react, judge and criticize, you are also gonna ultimately separate. Yes, 
which Precisely. is like the greatest, one of the greatest core wounds to feel abandoned and alone, unheard, actually, right? And then abandoned. That's exactly, I mean, in fact, we were talking about this recently, um, the abandonment wound, which I think is a, essentially a, an aspect of being human, right? This sense of, wow, I'm here and I don't really know what the heck I'm doing. Like where, you know, where is God? Where are the angels? Where are the, the uh, extraterrestrials? Where are all the beings that can guide me? And it's like, you just got to trust, you got to learn to trust your intuition. You got to go through this journey and you got to, and it's okay because there's the control freak side that ultimately gets in the way that becomes the dark side. The, the dark side wants to control everything and say, don't go there. Don't do that. Don't do this. Don't do that. That's going to hurt you. And it's like, it's your journey. It's each one of us learning. And, and sometimes you got to, you know, you got to fall down. It's actually, you can't learn to walk without falling down. You can't, you know, you can't jump without falling. Like there, it's part of the process. So the control side of things doesn't want to even explore. doesn't even want to like try it because it's so scared of letting go. And actually it's like our only freedom comes when we let go. That's when we can fly. Flying indeed. So we're going to take a very quick pause here and we come back. I'll be speaking to Sean Stone about some ETs, about some portals, about things maybe listeners don't know about. And first I want to tell you about a dog anthology. At this time, I decided to produce something joyful with levity. So there's a dog anthology. It's seeking authors to write a chapter. It's called Dogs Are Paradise. You can sign up at debbyd.net slash anthology. You can be a published author, not write an entire book. You can be an international best-selling author. It's guaranteed as part of the package. It's actually a huge package. Do you have a story to tell? A tale? A dog's tale? Because authors are signing up right now, and you can too, to write a chapter about a dog in this new compilation book. And when you come aboard, you'll be a published best-selling author in 2020. If it is time and you're interested, go register, debbyd.net slash anthology. It's spelled D-E-B-B-I-D dot net slash anthology. And if you're tuning in after we started, I'm speaking with Sean Stone. His new Audible book, Desiderata by Ali, is available from Audible on Amazon. And Sean, okay, I so many places to dive. So let's do the ET because you brought that up. Um, and we did get a listener question for you. So I want to go right there. Regarding ETs and ET technology, what, if any, ETs are you in contact with? And how are you in contact with them? Meaning, do you get visions through meditation? Is it telepathically? And if so, what kind of intel can you provide that is not readily available to the general public? What a great question. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's difficult. Personally, I feel a connection to a lot of different star systems. Um, there's symbolically in my life, there's been a lot of Orion energy but also uh, Sirius, the, uh, like more of the, uh, the, some of the blue beings in the Sirius star system. The Lyrans have shown up. The, I mean, the Pleiadians certainly are, are there. I was going to say that, but what do you mean by shown up? How do they well, show I'll up? Well, I'll get there. Uh, the, Ar the Arcturans are involved. What I'm trying to get at is, we're talking really more about interdimensional beings than something like a physical visitation. Right, we're talking interdimensionally. That there are things that we can't. I mean, we simply cannot fathom. The human consciousness is not designed in the old modality at the two to two, do two, two stranded double stranded double helix DNA modality, which was probably affected and tampered with by some level of visit of, of the visitors. Okay. Um, that version of humans was not designed to really see outside of the three D realm. Right. So many people misconstrued that level of consciousness to believe that was the end of consciousness. And so it's like telling me that you're basically a rat in a maze and you don't realize that the shadows that are being cast and the, the things that are affecting you beyond that maze, we would understand to be human. But at the level of the rat, they would never conceive what a human is. They would not be able to understand it. They would see a maybe a finger here, they would feel something, you know, there touching them, they would see a shadow, they wouldn't understand how to conceive of what a human looks like. 
right? Same with an ant. An ant can't see a human. It's like their, their perception is not allowed them to see the being that is us. Mm. So that's why, you know, for example, cats and other things, we know they see into other frequencies of existence, other frequencies of, of movement and, you know, beyond what our instrument that is the human instrument and then even instruments that we've invented can only measure a certain spectrum. So when we talk about what is an ET, I mean, you can't, there are maybe people that have, I don't doubt that people can physically see an ET or have seen an ET, but for me, it resonates more with the idea of beings beyond the third dimension that are in touch with us and they affect us more at the level of channeling or um, they show up maybe in ayahuasca journeys. Um, certain people are more sensitive when they start to feel <clears throat> something working through them or speaking through them and they inquire where these beings came from. So the, the star systems that I mentioned, I have had resonance with between my intuition that of, um, and that of others, let's say psychics that I have talked with over the years. And there's a certain consistency of the star systems that come up. Um, and in terms of my own intuition about my being, I feel that I am more of a, you know, a hybrid of, a multitude of, of star systems that ultimately it's as though the different star systems are effectively coming into more self understanding and actually um, more harmony with each other, even through our, their progeny, which is us. You see, we are the children of different star systems for a reason. It's the same as like, for example, why, um, you know, different races when they come together, it's like you start to mingle the DNA and the memory and the, the bloodlines of different of different uh, races and starts to create more harmonics actually between those races, right? It's very difficult to go to war with someone when you share the same children. Mm. So that's the way I see it as a galactic journey is that the human uh, experience of separation coming from separation to more unification as a planet, as a one planet, um, is actually also helping the overall uh, cosmos come into greater uh, concord. Interesting. Okay. And so is there anything, look, you're on, you do buzzsaw on Gaia. I know you speak to some really fascinating people, some of whom have also been on this show and some of whom I have not had the honor to talk to yet, but I would love to know between the conversations you've had and the experiences and maybe even the psychics you've spoken to, what is prevalent that we may not be privy to what's going on with the ETs and with the external energy and us and our planet i have no idea what the other psychics would say what i am picking up on and i think it's uh, maybe you know again where we are it's the interesting thing about life we, we can only see where we are you see, what, what, what comes back to us in terms of our consciousness is that when we reach a certain place, we start to see the world from that perspective, right? So it becomes a certain perspective that we have becomes more pronounced and gets reflected back to us. So what, what I'm seeing reflected back is an awareness of what's called the Great Awakening, right? There are those that are recognizing they're starting to reach that frequency of Great Awakening. I don't necessarily know that all of humanity will reach that great awakening because there's billions of people here. Everyone has to choose their own path. There are those who will go with the new world order plan. There may be, there may be a separation of earths in a sense, vibrationally, or even just within our own planet. It's as though the reality of someone who's living in the Amazon right now is totally different than the reality of someone living in a city. We are at the point what they call great awakening or is being, you know, hashtag great awakening. It's there's a reason that this theme is coming up. And those of us who are more sensitive to it have felt it in our bodies. We felt uh, the frequency well, shifting, right? There's a heavy sleep there's, being so interrupted. Oh my goodness. So much exhaustion, beautiful. right? And then beautiful throughout the so, whole night feeling these, these upgrade frequencies. Precisely. So, uh, for Kaya and I, we've certainly been feeling it for well over a year now, and we've been just put on a certain trajectory, mm -hmm. that is to say almost like digital nomads, such uh -huh. the place that when this pandemic occurred, we really weren't affected by it because we'd already shifted out of the modality of the city life and the grid and the system. 
So that's not to say that, you know, we're prophets in any sense. It's just to say that we are in tune with, I believe, with our Dharma. Yeah. And the Dharma has to do with the beginning of what is called a new earth or really the ascension process. And the ascension process, it's, it's, it's real. It's happening humans are being challenged in ways that they think has to do with physical reality and viruses, but this is all symbolic. See, the key to understanding life is at the symbolic level. At, that's, what, that's what it's about. It's about the symbol and what does it mean to you? Hmm. you know, what, is it, what, is, what is the symbol of a virus? What is the symbol of, of, a, of a city? What is the symbol of power? I mean, all these things are symbolic. When they occur, for example, people talk about the Illuminati. That's the level of symbolism, right? So that's why Masons and other occult schools have always spoken through symbolism, mm -hmm. use of uh, certain codes, certain phrases, certain hand signals, uh, certain images. It's the symbolic nature, but all of life is symbolic, actually. It's all affecting us at the level of symbol. When we see something, it's a symbol to us because the way that I experience, uh, for example, you know, I can give you any word. If I experience a pyramid, it'll be experienced by me in a different way than it'll be experienced by you. So at the symbolic level, we are beginning this ascension process in what is considered a global experience of pandemic, crisis, chaos, fear. Mm -hmm. That is to clean out your being, shake you up, and essentially find out where do you fit into this new schematics? Are you someone that's going to basically kowtow to what the agenda of the overlords tells you? Will you become basically a subservient person within a new world order structure? Or are you someone that is going to actually go to, go to the earth, connect to earth, especially in these time periods, connect to your, to your soul, really feel mm -hmm. into what's taking place at a much deeper level and start to really awaken because all the evidence is out now. You know, we talk about things, conspiracies, there's nowhere you can go at this point. You can go online and search. And I, you, you want to see UFOs? You'll see UFOs. Right. You want to you learn about the conspiracies? It's there. Buzzsaw, we talked about all this stuff. And if you can't accept that until the mainstream media tells you it's true, mm. then your entire thinking is wrong. Mm. Because you shouldn't need the mainstream media to affirm something when you know the truth. I don't, you see what I'm saying? It's like you don't need... A dogma. You don't need a religion to tell you the truth. You don't need a politician to tell you the truth. You don't need someone on CNN to tell you the truth. The beauty of the ascension process is that we become the sovereigns. Each one of us as humans, we become the sovereigns of our domain, of our being. We know we have the inner gnosis, the inner technology to know, to recognize and discern the truth, which is ultimately for our journey. And not to say the truth for me is the truth for you, but I don't need someone to affirm it. I don't need someone to tell me this is what, uh, th this is the way to think. This is the way to behave. This is how to feel. That time period was the school of the Piscean age. Where are we entering? We're entering the age of Aquarius. That's where you exit the school. You become the bearer of the water. You become the bearer of the information and the wisdom. Trust in you. That's the power. You are the revolution. Oh my God, what a huge takeaway. I really felt the potency of that, having sovereignty over oneself, one's life, one's potency. Like, pff, that's, that's really a beautiful notion out of this chaos and being shoken up, shooken up and awoken up all at the same time about what's possible. So what are you doing every day to get through this? I know you've got your morning, wait, your meditation, Meditation, <laughs> your morning meditation, which is an awesome play on words. And I know I've seen pictures, we're friends on Instagram and Facebook, so I've seen your pictures out there in the cliffs and everything. So what are you doing on a daily basis? What are your rituals that are really keeping you awake and connected to you know, more of the frequencies and downloads right now? Of course, of course. Again, I, I mentioned getting back to the earth. I think it's very important. Uh, As an earth thing? In, in a sense of just getting out of the cities. <laughs> Kai, and I, Kai and I have really been drawn to uh, vortexes, to just you know, the earth energy, to being away from the cities, to, being, uh, you know, to doing our practice. I mean, certainly she teaches breath work, which is itself a very powerful 
tool to access the unconscious mind and to by, yeah, essentially bypass all the, the thoughts and the things that get in the way of our uh, experience of life. But breath work is important. I do my meditation. I think uh, Qigong, I think Kundalini Yoga, I think practices like this can be really important to move the energy. Uh, certainly you want to stay, you know, you really want to be in touch with the body at this point because our body is, let's be honest, it's, uh, it's our vessel into this world. It's our instrument in this world. If we don't honor and protect and value this body, well, we have nothing. We'll be taken away. It'll fall. It doesn't matter if it falls to a corona or to a flu or to a cancer or to, you name it. There's a, there's a million things in this world that will kill you. Yes. So, you know, it shouldn't be this. That's why I just, I, I get so baffled by this nature of this pandemic because the whole point is it's about our own immune system. It's our own bodies. And it's not the virus that will kill you. It's the toxicity that will kill you. We're living in atmospheres and environments that are toxic to the human body, whether it's uh, the, the, the overall, you know, the smog levels, the, the pollution in the water sources, uh, the, the GMOs in the food. I mean, you, you can name a thousand different ways that we are toxicity leaching into our environment, into our bodies, right? Um, and then, you know, now they're magnifying it with this 5G rollout, which is to say to put cell towers, they're trying to put cell towers on almost every home. I mean, think about the insanity of that. When I was a kid in the 90s, it was basic knowledge. You didn't put a cell phone to your head and you didn't want to live right next to a cell tower. And now they think that it's okay to put a cell tower in everyone's home because people just want faster internet. I'm sorry. There's at some point you have to say enough is enough with your lies. You're, you're literally killing us with these lies. The toxicity we've seen in our lifetime has grown. And yet they call us conspiracy theorists for calling it out. So the point is that if we don't recognize that toxicity is what kills, it's not viruses that kill. You have, I don't even know how many viruses in your body right now. Right. I do too. That's part of life. Viruses also have helped us to make up our current DNA. And mm -hmm. in our current DNA structure is filled with viruses and bacteria. That's fine. That's not what kills us. What kills us is the toxicity. And that's what we're not focused on because we have, again, we follow the mainstream media. We follow the, the reports of people that they call themselves the, you know, the scientific establishment. And they're no different than the priest class of old. The ones that told you, this is how you have to live the life of your life. Otherwise, you will go to hell and you will go to heaven. And it's like, no, where is, you know, where is the alternative media allowed? It's not allowed on YouTube and on Facebook. It's not allowed in, in the mainstream media. They don't give voice and platform to alternative points of view on these things. So why can't we at least have the courage to listen and think for ourselves and to, and to realize there's a reason that everyone in, in America is sick at some level? I mean... And I have to say everyone, but let's be honest, look around. I mean, we know this. There's obesity issues. There's cancer issues. There's so much going on that we can say it's just, it just has to do with basic self-care principles that are lacking. Mm. So really, is it a conspiracy to talk about what's causing that? Or is it not just common sense? Right, right, right. And at least to investigate and make sovereign decisions about um, so how about free energy or zero point energy? And for people wondering about that, zero point energy is the lowest possible energy that a quantum mechanical system can have. Do you know anything about free energy or have any new information on zero point energy? Hmm. No, I mean, I'm not studied enough at this time um, to speak about zero point um, you know, overall, I mentioned earlier about 5G and the rollout of these EMF systems. And I just want to be clear. It's not that I'm opposed to the notion of wireless um, transmissions. I think what's missing is that, A, the real debate and study of what are safe levels of transmissions of wireless, um, really radiation, right, EMF radiation. But more importantly, there's a principle that I believe Tesla was getting into with his work and his studies mm -hmm. well over a hundred years ago now. And it was the idea of tapping into natural earth energy. The idea that the earth, as we know, not only has a Schumann resonance, but there's essentially energy within earth. There's energy within the human body is energy, right? We are coursing electric beings. The air around us is filled with energy. Tesla was trying to figure out how to transmit energy directly from the earth through the, through, through the sky, right? Using uh, natural means of conducting 
and distributing that energy. And I'm not saying if you, whether or not he succeeded or not, I mean, I, I can't go there, but I'm saying that the, the idea, the philosophy is what interests me. Why is it that we don't want to challenge this rollout of EMF that really is going to blanket the entire planet with a different frequency level that is, can be argued as shown that can affect everything from the birds to the humans that, it, that it's in touch with, right? Our frequency, because we are energetic beings. Rather than blanketing the whole planet with a new frequency, why can't we study more the idea of tapping into natural earth harmonics and natural earth frequencies for the powering of our technologies and for, you know, just for the evolution of technology in general, which is one argument as to what the Great Pyramids were involved with in the first place was the idea that they may have been involved with transmitting energy to begin with. So the, to me, the overall shift in consciousness that has to come out of this ascension process is recognizing the human is not a 3D, but as really a 5D and beyond being, fifth dimensional and beyond being, that is to say an energetic being that's interdimensional in our energy body, but also in our thought processes we know. We don't simply exist in three-dimensional reality. Even our thoughts take us out of it. Our dreams certainly do. So if we can recognize more of the fifth dimensional nature of the energy body that is the human being and how we are being affected all times by the energies around us, can we become more intelligent in how we dispatch wireless energies and absorb the wireless energies that are being transmitted? Yeah, thank you for clarifying. I appreciate that. Uh, Excellent. Yeah. And technology at its finest. It's, it's, it's another way of altering DNA too. <laughs> so, uh, we're going to take a very quick pause here. I'm a media visibility shaman. I help clients to express their unique roar. And as a certified coach, I offer group and private sessions to help you write a page turner book. I run a company that takes your book to a guaranteed international bestseller. And also I teach you how to be interviewed on radio and podcast and get results. And you can now join the Visible Visionaries. It is a new, very low cost membership that's opened up for people who do wanna write a book and don't know where to start, who wanna learn all the pieces about becoming way more visible. And I will say this to you, if you're a light worker, if you're a spiritual entrepreneur, if you are here with a message, let me tell you it is your time to shine and get your message out there. How do you do it? Through media, it's so easy and beautiful. And as Sean was saying, why not have your own voice for media and teach what's really going on. <laughs> so go to debbie-inger.com slash visible visionaries. That's D-E-B-B-I-D-A-C-H-I-N-G-E-R.com slash visible visionaries. Welcome back. Dare to dream. Debbie Dashinger. I'm interviewing Sean Stone. You can get his morning meditation at patreon.com slash Sean Stone. And Sean, let's see, I guess, let me ask you, with everything going on, this is Dare to Dream. What are you next Dare to Dream? What is your next dream for the future or the right after this that would be so, such a beautiful outcome for who we are and where we are and all the possibilities of yes. what's happening? Absolutely. Yes, yes, yes. No, the way that I would imagine the future is as we're moving through this ascension process we're birthing a, a new earth which is to say a new relationship to ourselves to our planet to each other to our economy because how we relate to each other and how we transact with each other is our economy i envision that we move away from the pyramidal structure of power which is to say the even the issuing of money currency from a central bank that issues it at interest. So essentially it's always, you're always in debt and forever in debt, perpetually in debt to that bank. I see it more that we are shifting into a transaction of energy between beings. And you could use the blockchain, for example, and that transparency is as one means of helping to regulate it. It could be cryptocurrencies I could see involved in this whole thing to decentralize and uh, re-regulate the overall nature of the transactions but the overall idea is that instead of seeing currency as a fixed thing a fixed thing that has to be issued it actually as energy because currency is what it's a current it's energy mm. as energy we always have 
think we always have more to offer each day. Every one of us has things to offer and it can be simple things, whether it's our consciousness, sharing consciousness becomes itself a modality of making money, whether it's sharing our consciousness as participants in platforms, um, even in terms of purchasing from a certain source. It's like, I say it like this, it's shifting away from the idea of I'm paying this corporate brand and I'm thankful to have its product as opposed to the idea of actually we're both thankful. The brand is thankful to have me as a client and have me as, as, as a, you know, as, as a consumer. And so there should be some more reciprocity shared between the brand and the consumer. And I think that translates then to all walks of life. So it's as though the overall nature of economy becomes value, valuing each human being that is your consumer, that is consuming your idea, your product, um, your food, whatever it may be. And at the same time, uh, the, the consumer having really, you know, appreciating what they're receiving so that we become more conscious as an economy and how we transact with each other, no longer listening to, you know, the mainstream narrative of follow this artist, buy that brand, you know, uh, shop from this major food chain. It's no longer the centralization and consolidation of power that was the pyramid structure. It's more the harmonics of circles where everyone is in reciprocity with each other and doing and doing reciprocity in the, in the nature of their transaction so that there's much more respect and honor. So if we can, I, as, as light beings, as beings that are conscious, that are aware, that are looking for the, really the, the best interest of the planet, of each other, come together and transact, we can shift, I believe, in creating our own economies that are perhaps outside of that so-called mainstream economy, economy that really is prom promoting itself based on brainwashing through uh, mask, you know, branding, uh, playing commercials over and over again, putting themselves on billboards and whatnot, really to uh, drive the money out of your hands, out of the hands of most people into the hands of the few. And we're saying, no, it's, more, it's not about the major uh, conglomerate and monopoly anymore. It's really about the small and mid-sized businesses, you know, all having a voice and all transacting amongst each other, not to have this mass conglomerate monopolies that was the, the, the dream of capitalism all through the 20th century and ultimately led to uh, a world where, as we know, the resources, uh, the wealth is in the hands of what's called the 1% and probably even fewer if you really boil it down to the few thousand corporations that have so much power and influence on this planet. Mm. Now, you and Kaya are doing breathwork workshops. You're working together at this time, is that right? And I know the name of that is Sacred Academy, or is it just her baby and you step in now and then? I'm just curious if you can talk a little bit about breathwork and sure. what have you found there? So it's intentionally changing the breath. I've experienced it. And just share some, um, maybe what you've seen or what you've experienced that's been really altering. Yes, yes. So, so her academy is called the Sacred Breath Academy. Uh, she founded it before I met her. Uh, I've, I've done breath work with her as far as she's, you know, she has uh, led groups and, and things like this, and I've done breath work, but I don't, facil I don't facilitate as a breath work uh, instructor. Um, I, what I do with her, we do some workshops together, uh, which is to say that we do uh, offer people a sort of um, an opportunity to do both uh, conscious and unconscious work. So the conscious work is to discuss in, during the workshop, you know, to discuss things that people are going through at their soul level and their journey and to bring up things like conscious communication uh, techniques, um, uh, various uh, understandings basically of how we can become uh, more integrated beings. I think that's really the, the thrust of what the workshop is. And the second part of the workshops do entail a breathwork session that Kaya leads but uh, no, her specialty is training, actually. She trains teachers and other facilitators of breath work, and she teaches them uh, all around the world. You know, Bali, she does trainings, and she's done them in North Carolina and California. So um, she's really more of a, a breath work instructor. And what does breath work mean? Breath work is really a, a, a modality that, again, there are many different techniques because really you could argue that breath work is involved with yoga, for example. It's involved with certain meditation techniques and mantras. Her form of breath work has more to do with uh, going deep into the unconscious on these journeys to excavate uh, 
maybe soul memories, wounds, traumas, also creative genius. I mean, she goes into a very deep hour long plus journey with, uh, with her clients. And so it's a very special experience and uh, it's certainly one aspect of the workshops we offer together. But um, yeah, she, you know, she has her own genius and her own brand and her own, uh, her own uh, shamanic uh, healing medicine to offer. Oh, you're so proud of her. It's really lovely to see. Oh, <laughs> well, indeed. I mean, um, it's, it's wonderful to see someone who, you know, who's actually was a young woman who's actualizing her gifts in a world. I think that oftentimes, too often, um, many people, especially, you know, young women are, are falling into the traps of uh, a corporate system that is really built on exploitation, let's be honest, you know, especially of women. Um, in a way that's even, uh, as we know, more gruesome. You know, we see it all the time, and our it becomes daily habit to see, you know, women uh, in the modeling industries, you know, or Instagram trying, you know, modeling themselves, showing themselves off, just you know, really using our sexual attraction to them to uh, promote whatever brand or whatever message, as opposed to, you know, someone like Kaya who's basically saying, use the gifts that you have as a woman to, you know, try to empower each other and teach and heal and get out of this modality of objectification. Yeah, it's funny you say that. I've been pegged quite a few times on Instagram by several companies to become a brand ambassador. And I'll always do the due diligence and the research and it's amazing the photos I see and the way people are dressed. And I mean, it's so, it's like this step over from porn, honestly. And I was more recently approached by a bathing suit company and I don't know. You know, so I do my research because I want to make sure I'm in a complete alignment and integrity. If I'm going to represent, I need to really feel good about a product and what I'm putting out there. So I, that's just a really low level way I've experienced it, but I know exactly. And I'm curious, uh, Sean, because so you've run businesses, whether it was filmmaking or being a host or uh, being a spokesperson or, you know, now some of these workshops you're doing, but you've run many very successful businesses creatively. What are some of the habits that you have that help those businesses succeed? Well, I think, you know, first of all, I'm a Capricorn. <laughs> okay, that <laughs> answers everything. Uh, the Capricorn <laughs> mentality is that we are very, very driven. In very. fact, one of the things that I've been working on doing is relaxing and seeing success mm -hmm. less, looking at success less from that old modality, that old paradigm, which was based simply on the concrete result and everything that we have to put into it to get to that concrete result and actually learning to really be in love with the process and learning to just enjoy the process. That's, that's really what it boils down to. Everything is process in life. And the problem we have actually, a lot of us as a planet in that old paradigm was the notion that people were successful when they, uh, you know, made a lot of money or they earned, you know, their, their core, their businesses quarterly reports were good. And as we know, no business is going to sustain itself forever. There's always going to be uh, peaks and troughs and cycles, but that's really the way the nature works. Nature is meant to be cyclical. It's meant, you're meant to have seasons of, of growth and the sun shines and, and you bask in that sun. And then the fall comes and you may be going more internal in the winters, winter times. And you learn, the earth has to die, you know, it's like the tree has to die, you have to die internally to be reborn again in spring. That's, these are the kind of things that interest me more. It's the, the process of um, what it is to be human and to feel and to experience and explore, um, rather than saying, well, you know, how successful was the business? I mean, that, there's a great quote from Gate, from a, uh, Bill, uh, sorry, uh, Steve Jobs at the end of his life, he talks about, yeah, you know, for all the, the, the watches and the, the, the billions you know that I've made and all this it's like I can't treat any of that for more time with my family and you know that's really what it is so many people in our society are sick with this desire for for success there uh, <laughs> so many people are just, so many people are just, you know sick with this, the desire for success they're sick with the desire for more for acquisition for proof of validation of what they are and they're not necessarily getting to really just live their life and explore their their joy and their happiness if we could and this is what the new paradigm I believe is about. The new earth is about letting go of the old expectation and aspiration that this will make you happy as opposed to saying, no, be happy in the process. And if you're happy in the process, that's what matters.
and whatever that may be. It's why people are quitting their jobs as CEOs. They're, they're dropping out from that old structure of, again, parasitism, not patriarchy, but parasitism that was just, you know, about feeding the top and, you know, sacrificing yourself and suffering for the, you know, for the sake of the boss or the sake of the, the, the control apparatus that, that, that dictates a company policy. And people are saying, no, I'm done with that. I'm going to go and travel the world, be a digital nomad, and just, you know, find my bliss. I mean, that's really what life's about, man. It's about being happy in the journey if you're fulfilled. And so for me, I've been fulfilled by my creative endeavors. I've been fulfilled by my writing, my writing processes, even though films that haven't been made. Uh, you know, it's like there's just so much joy in the actual writing and exploration of, of reality and the buzzsaw interviews, you know, talking to people about things that are far out or writing Desiderata, which is, you know, just a beautiful love story. You know what? That's that's the joy. You know, if people can can tap into it and and and, and enjoy it, then that makes me happy to share that with them. But uh, I can't, ex you know, I can't wait for you know a bestseller to make me happy or the notion of that's what success is to make me happy. Yeah, that's truly being present. I love that. A meta human with Deepak Chopra. What was the takeaway on the human experience for you after working on that project? That really blew my mind. I must say, uh, I was, I, I told Kaya when I was making it, I said, I think I basically have left this old paradigm. That was very much for me, a cracking of the old paradigm. That was like the end of it because, um, there's a, the film itself really dives deep. If, if people should watch it on YouTube, it's, it's available meta human, but it dives deep into this question of what the heck it means to be a human being. Mm -hmm. What am I? And the way Deepak poses it, it's just so beautiful. It's just like, you're just a consciousness. You know, you're just a consciousness that perceives itself as this because we have an ego. So we say, you know, I am Sean and you're Debbie. But it's like, we're just a consciousness having this experience. And along the way, you know, we're creating labels and judgments and beliefs. But really, none of it is true. None of it lasts. It's just the experience in consciousness. And it's like, it's very easy to say that. But the more you actually dive into that, understanding it really will destroy your old worldview it really will undermine the old belief system and structures because people let's be honest we've built the old paradigm that old system of the pyramid of power because people wanted to give themselves some concrete finitude towards their reality because otherwise it's like wait what happens then i don't have a boss to report to anymore oh my god i'm free that's the most terrifying thing of all i mean this is the existentialists talk about they're like this is the burden of freedom this is what do I do? <laughs> How do I decide? Make the choice for me. Come on, give me the options. Coke or Pepsi? Don't tell me I have a million choices. I'm going to go crazy because people have put themselves into slavery. That's what, that's what, that's the beautiful paradox about this whole thing. It's like, I tell people, I say all the time, paradox is the only truth. If you don't understand paradox, you cannot see truth. Because it's, yes, at one level, there's a slave system that operates financially and how we're controlled by these societies and the economies. But there's also the deeper rooted aspect a belief structure within humans that says, I want to be a slave because I'm terrified of being free. Tell me what And until we can excavate and, and really like uproot that fear of the freedom, until we can really get into that, and I'm not saying that I'm fully there. I mean, it's like, it's very difficult to be an actualized, activated human being. But once you're like on that path, which is really the spiritual path, just breaking down the, the, the ideologies and the structures that were holding us back and telling us how to do things and when you wake up with the alarm, you have to go to this, you have to have your, your coffee and your breakfast, and you have to go to work and you have to pay this bill and it's you know, tax day and all that nonsense. If you really get to the root of it, you realize it's all there because we're terrified of what's, what's, what's the opposite of it, which is just infinite possibility. Mm. On that note, infinite possibility. Sean, thank you so much for coming on the show again today. It's always a joy to talk to you. It's really, really interesting, and I enjoyed this. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Debbie. Pleasure. And I end the show today with this quote from Hal Borland. Knowing trees, I understand the meaning of patience. Knowing grass, I can appreciate persistence. Subscribe to the Dare to Dream podcast to hear the weekly number one transformation conversation. I'm very excited. Upcoming is the amazing Dr. Sue Mortar, who is an amazing and brilliant transformational leader. This will be her third time on the show. 
That's a conversation you absolutely don't want to miss. And if you're listening to the podcast, be sure to jump over to the YouTube channel at youtube.com slash Debbie Dashinger, where you can actually see me and the guest interacting. It's well worth it. Thank you for daring to dream. Thank you for being willing to create your dreams into your reality. And remember the secret of success is always having the courage to begin in the first place. If you're interested in a book and writing a chapter, go to debbyd.net slash anthology. And if you're interested in exploring being visible by being interviewed and writing a book, go to debbydashinger.com slash visible visionaries.